Okay. Is subject to education. What is your stance on the federal Pell Grants program? Are you for cuts to this program? Why or why not? I am absolutely against cuts to the federal Pell Grant program. You know, if you look at what's happened to college uh, affordability and accessibility, it has gone down dramatically over the last decade and two decades, and that's something we have to change. If we're going to have that highly skilled and competitive workforce and we want to compete in the 21st century, and that's something, unfortunately, that in the Ryan budget, they do cut Pell Grants. In fact, for 9.6 million students, they reduced the Pell Grants, and for over a million students, they actually get rid of Pell Grants. Now, we need to make sure that college is affordable and accessible. My wife, for the last 10 years, has been on a board, um, the Access College Foundation, focusing just on this right here in Hampton Roads, making sure that any student in Hampton Roads graduating high school that wants to go to college can find the, the dollars and the money to, to uh, actually make that happen. So we're big proponents of Pell Grants. We're big proponents of, uh, of Stafford loans. And unfortunately, in this day and time, when you, when you see the... Uh, Dollars increasing at the college level. You see our state of Virginia continuing to de decrease the dollars that they actually uh, provide to students. In fact, if you look at the state of Virginia versus the state of North Carolina, we provide less than half the dollars per student that the state of North Carolina does to colleges. Now, that's something wrong in our state that we need to change. But one way to do that is we begin to work at the federal level and we make sure that we're providing those individuals with the Pell Grants and Stafford loans and all those things that allow them access to college so they can become that highly skilled workforce. Barry that uh, Scott and Paul agree on that um, no cuts to Pell Grants. Um, education gives opportunity to uh, everyone and uh, Scott supports Pell Grants. He supports um, uh, increasing uh, opportunities for uh, college folks. That's why since day one he's been focused on job creation. Um, all the legislation that you've seen him, seen him support and, and debate and talk about uh, throughout the district. Uh, he, he understands about job creation. Uh, he's worked with the General Assembly, uh, both Senator Warner and Senator Webb with regards to protecting our military interests, which allows uh, our economy to grow here. And the second district is strongly thriving on, on, on government dollars and we need to protect that. That's why, again, he's um, put forth amendments with regards to stopping sequestration. Uh, he supports balanced budgets, which for which will in turn help us to prioritize and control spending, which will in fact help these job training programs and such. Again, uh, again, that's one area that probably Paul and, and Scott agree on, that uh, education is a great um, door opener and gives opportunity for everyone, especially in this room. Uh, thank you. Um, we need to increase Pell Grants um, the, it's, it means it gives people access to college. College can transform a person's uh, trajectory in life, opportunities, uh, job opportunities, and everything else. Uh, just transformed with a college education, and we need to improve that. Unfortunately, the Republican budget cut Pell grants by thousand dollars, and would have allowed student interest on student loans to double. The fact of the matter is, we don't get our budget under control. Uh, we're not going to have any money for Pell grants, and that's why I proposed. Uh, doing something concrete about the budget. Uh, let me just, to, to get out of the abstract, let me just say where we can get the money. Let the Bush tax cuts expire, all of them. That's $4 trillion. That'll get you back to the Clinton rates. You talk about growth, over 20 million jobs. Dow Jones Industrial Average in eight years almost quadrupled. When you hit the Bush level, uh, worst job performance since the Great Depression, and the Dow Jones average was worse at the end than the beginning. Uh, the um, Treat investment income like regular income. That's another trillion. Uh, debt financing, don't give uh, an incentive to uh, debt financing for corporations as opposed to equity financing. Uh, that's another trillion. 5% five, five uh, surcharge on that portion of your income over a million dollars. That's about half, half, uh, that's about half a trillion. Uh, the uh, oil subsidies and all that, get rid of them. That'll give you uh, another about half a trillion. That's almost seven trillion dollars. You need four to get close Five will get you a balanced budget and take it into surplus. Thank you. I, I'd just like to make a point of order here just to make sure we're clear on the record. You know, Congressman Scott said that he, he actually balanced the budget back in 1993. I, I believe that was your freshman year in Congress, if I'm not mistaken. 
And uh, since then, we've grown to $16 trillion in debt since that first year. But uh, the Republican budget did, in fact, uh, increase student loan rates or propose to increase, increase student loan rates, but the purpose behind increasing that student loan rates was to be able to fund Pell Grants. So we could increase the number of Pell Grants that are out there. Uh, the, basically, your, your increase in your interest rate will add about $7 a month to every student that's, that's using the student loan. And for, for an affordable amount of money, we're able to uh, provide sustainability to the Pell Grant program. Without a doubt, both of these programs are uh, are crucial to be able to make sure we've got people going through college, and as you heard me say at the beginning, I mean, you guys are the future. Uh, this round will begin again with the second district, but we'll change it around. We began with the Republican side, and we'll start with Mr. Hershey's side. The reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act has been stalled on its way towards passage this year. It provides crucial support to university shelters, rape crisis, hotlines, and counseling programs in addition to legal resources for victims of violence. Although you work across the aisle and with the Senate to see that this historically bipartisan initiative continues to protect all who are faced with relationship and sexual violence. As you know, the House and Senate have both uh, passed the reauthorization of the Violence Against uh, Women Act. In conflict, Congress must simply exercise basic civics and have a conference on enough details. Um, Scott from day one has shown that he, he, he can reach across the aisle. He's actually started a bipartisan caucus to get Congress to um, be practical and, and meet on a regular basis, and he'll do such again if, if he's reelected. Um, I've seen him um, at the local and state levels reach out to both Republicans and Democrats with regards to finding solutions for the, on behalf of the second district, and he will again do such uh, on behalf of this measure. You know, and that Congressman Ridgell decided not to be here tonight, I, I came into this um, um, with the uh, position that I was not going to say anything against, you know, his record, because I believe he's not here, and so it's not fair to do that. But one thing I do want to make sure that we get clear, going back to Pell Grants, Congressman Ridgell voted twice for the Ryan budget, which does decrease Pell Grants and gets rid of them for a million students, decreases them for another ten million. So. Congressman Rachel did vote to decrease that. Now, in terms of the Violence Against Women Act, you know, I think this is another thing that it has not been passed, and it's ludicrous that it has not been passed. Historically, it was always a bipartisan um, bill that was, was pushed right through, but unfortunately, it's the partisanship up in Washington now that's keeping it. One side and the other, I believe it's the Republicans that don't want to make sure any of the changes the Democrats want in it are actually passed through. This is something that just we have got to pass. It is just a sign of the the gridlock and the, the least effective Congress we've had in the last 70 years, continuing in their way of not being able to agree on anything. We've got to change that, um, or we're not going to be able to move our country forward, and this is just a prime example of one of those. Well, go I'll go. <laughs> you know, violence against any group is absolutely unacceptable. And I support many of the provisions of the Violence Against Women Act. Many of the people in my life and in my family have been victims of violence by their spouse or their boyfriend. So we need to make this program work. But the problem is, it's not working because it's sitting in Washington. It's a federal program where Republicans are yelling at Democrats right now, and we don't have a fully vibrant program. We need this program to get pushed down to the state level where we can make sure it's enacted, where we can make sure that it's tailored specifically to the problems that, are, that the states are facing. Right now, with it sitting in Washington, it's going nowhere. And it's had a history of having problems because it's been in Washington. The ACLU and the Concerned Women for Americans brought lawsuits against it. In fact, the Supreme Court at one point even found part of it unconstitutional at the federal level. So we need to get the program away from Washington 
And we need to get it down to the state level so it can work and it can work well and you can rely on the provisions within it to be there when you need it. Uh, the Violence Against Women Act was passed several years ago with strong bipartisan support, has up for reauthorization, and needs to be reauthorized. Unfortunately, partisan Republicans in the House have messed it up so badly by putting things like uh, mandatory minimums, which have been shown to uh, uh, violate common sense in many, uh, many instances, and have been, uh, by all the criminal justice organizations have been trying to get rid of mandatory minimums, they put mandatory minimums in there. There's a provision in there that um, puts in dangerous immigrants and several other provisions that have messed it up so bad that all the advocacy groups that were supporting it recommended a no vote when it came to the House. Uh, we can do better than that. If we get together and uh, work together on a bipartisan basis, uh, we can pass a, uh, a, a good bill. The Senate, in a bipartisan basis, uh, pass a decent bill, and we can use that as, as, as a model. But uh, there's not going to be any funding for violence against women unless we get the budget under un, under uh, control. Uh, uh, Mr. Longo mentioned that putting things on the record. I'm not sure exactly what he got on the record, other than the 1993 vote that put us on a trajectory to balancing the budget, going into surplus, and at, at the end of eight years put us in a situation where we were on track to paying off the entire debt held by the public. That bill passed in the House without a single Republican vote, in the Senate without a single Republican vote, and they demagogued it and picked up seats as a result. We can uh, balance the budget and go into surplus, but it's going to take some tough choices. appeals the Defense of Marriage Act and requires the federal government and all states to recognize a legal marriage performed in the state. Furthermore, would you co-sponsor Every Child Deserves a Family Act, which prohibits discrimination in adoption or foster care placements based on the sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital status of any prospective adoptive or foster parent, or the sexual orientation or gender identity of the child involved? Discrimination in our country is wrong in any format in any way, overt or covert, it is wrong. And so, yes, I believe in gay marriage, and I would co-sponsor all of those bills. Congressman Rachel's uh, response is, this issue should be determined by the people and not thrust upon by, by them by unelected judges. He supports the conscious protections of religious communities, for chaplains on military installations, and he supports the protection of the family. Um, thank you. The Defense of Marriage Act was either unconstitutional or unnecessary. If a state has to uh, acknowledge, give full faith and credit to marriages in other states, uh, then a statute passed by Congress has no effect, it's unconstitutional. If, on the other hand, you do not have to give full faith and credit to those marriages, uh, then it's unnecessary. They don't have to give full faith and credit to those marriages. So it's either to begin with uh, unnecessary or unconstitutional. Um, there is nothing in any of the, the legislation that would require anyone to marry somebody of the same sex if they don't want to, nor within the uh, religious uh, free exercise clause of our Constitution require any minister that doesn't want to perform such a marriage to perform one. Uh, so um, in, in terms of getting rid of the Defense of Marriage Act, uh, yes, I would, I would support that. I voted against it to begin with. Um, and, the, uh, and the other, the uh, elimination of discrimination, uh, I, I would support that too. You know, I'm for American rights, for civil rights, and for liberties. I believe in equality for every citizen freely choose their path through life. And I believe in giving everyone equal opportunity to succeed. I mean, this country was founded on our God-given rights to choose. So I personally don't have any problem with LGBT community. I was against the don't ask, don't tell policy. 
and a policy that excluded gays from the military to begin with.